A woman's life during the Civil War was difficult, painful, and often dangerous. Women's roles were quickly changing, which means that the history of that time is full of incredible, inspiring, and heartbreaking female stories. Civil War soldier Jack Williams was in reality one Frances Clayton, a woman who disguised herself as a man and is believed to have served in the Missouri Cavalry alongside her husband. He died at the Battle of Stones River in 1862, and Frances Clayton wasn't the only one. It's estimated that anywhere from 400 to 1,000 women joined up secretly, although it's impossible to know for sure. The truth is that soldiering paid better than nursing. Women got away with the deception because the physical exam to enlist was more concerned with their teeth and ability to hold a musket than their genitals. Young men under 18 signed up despite being underage, so a young-looking boy who didn't shave wouldn't arouse suspicion. Women cut their hair, bound their breasts, wore loose clothing, and performed as well as any man. A female soldier fought and or died in every major battle of the war. Overall, they served with distinction. In fact, women had a 14% promotion rate, 4% higher than men. While one female soldier's cover was blown shortly after she was promoted to sergeant because she gave birth, women were most often found out only when they needed medical attention. And when they were, most were simply sent home, while some were briefly in prison. In one bizarre instance, a female prison guard disguised as a man found herself in charge of a woman in jail for impersonating a male soldier. Civil War nurses owed their career to Florence Nightingale's work in the Crimean War seven years earlier. Nightingale made nursing an acceptable profession for women, especially in the middle and upper classes. It was the first time in American history that women were allowed to be a significant part of a war effort, and they answered the call by the thousands. The Union had the United States Sanitary Commission and the indefatigable Dorothea Dix, who was appointed superintendent to female nurses of the Union Army by the Secretary of War. She had very strict rules for her employees, including that they must be, quote, past 30 years of age, healthy, plain almost to repulsion in dress, and devoid of personal attractions. Shall I find a doctor to assist? You do it. Ask yourself. What would Dix do? Not sure what that says about Clara Barton and Louisa May Alcott, who both signed up. Union nurses were paid 40 cents a day, and they had to work at least three months. The South was behind in nursing, as in most things, compared to the North. Only four states had formal relief agencies, and there was no national organization for the Confederacy. The women who volunteered didn't receive the same kind of training as those in the North, but many did incredible jobs anyway. Phoebe Pember ran the South's largest medical facility, Chimborazo Hospital, while Sally Tompkins paid for a 22-bed hospital with her own money. Plus, she was the only woman officially commissioned in the Confederate Army. The Northern Home Front had one major benefit over the South. Most of the battles were fought far away. In general, Northern women didn't have to worry about violence on their doorstep. They spent their time gathering supplies for the troops and working as activists and nurses. Many of them were entering the workforce for the first time and doing the jobs of men. The North had huge advantages over the South at the start of the war, namely that the top half of the country had factories and other manufacturing. But then the men, especially poorer men who were working in the fields, went to war. That left women to take their places. They took factory and mill jobs, including making the munitions used by the Union Army. But more and more men went to fight over the years, and soon women were needed for other jobs, like working in offices and for the government. By the end of the war, women made up one-third of manufacturing workers, and the United States government was the largest employer of women. In more rural areas of the North, women managed their farms when the men left, and they still had to care for children and do regular domestic duties. But the war gave women responsibility and independence they'd never had before. The South was a horrible place for women or anyone to be during the Civil War. There were fewer people, fewer supplies, fewer railroads, and plenty more battles close at hand. But white women managed to make it work most of the time. Many elite white women had pushed their husbands to support secession and were very proud of the cause. They shamed pacifist men into joining the army, and single women swore to only marry men who served. Meanwhile, when the guys left, ladies took over the plantations and businesses. They volunteered as nurses and raised funds for the cause. But poor white women didn't have such a great time of it. The war made their economic hardships even worse. As for the fighting, well, the battles on their doorstep were bad enough. Then Sherman came. Union General William T. Sherman engaged in total war in his march to the sea. Women in his path evacuated by the thousands. Their homes were burned. The men of the Union Army terrorized white women they came across, which included sexual assault. This only made some women support the cause more, while others begged their men to desert the army and come home. No matter how bad it is, it's always worse for women. This is even true of slavery. 
You'd think living in bondage was as bad as it could get, but the Civil War brought new challenges to enslaved women. Once a conflict started, enslaved men were taken from their homes to build military fortifications, work for Confederate officers, or sent to factories. This all left the backbreaking plantation work to the women. They were expected to do the same work the men had done. The war also caused the price of slaves to skyrocket, so there was a greater chance that they would see their children sold and families broken up. They might also have to leave their loved ones behind if forced to flee with their masters from the Union Army. Despite the Emancipation Proclamation, slaves were not free. Men were more likely to escape, which meant the women left behind took the brunt of the punishment. Enslaved women helped to undermine the slave system by breaking tools, performing work slowdowns, and helping to organize escapes. Women usually had to wait for very specific circumstances before they could make a break for it. If the Union Army came close to their plantation, their chances of successful escape were much greater. Children and elderly slaves also used close proximity to the Union lines as an opportunity to run to freedom, but their loss to a plantation wasn't considered as bad as that of an able-bodied man. At a time when the women's rights movement was in its infancy, it was hard for them to become activists. Of course, it was even harder if you were a black woman, and that didn't stop them. Sojourner Truth was already a famous abolitionist and women's rights advocate by the time the war rolled around. During the conflict, she recruited black soldiers to the Union Army. She also worked for the National Freedmen's Relief Association, personally encouraging people to donate food and clothes to black refugees fleeing from the South. When President Lincoln invited her to the White House, she pulled a Rosa Parks 90 years early and rode in whites on the streetcars. Harriet Tubman had been helping slaves escape since 1851, a dangerous, potentially deadly job where she had many close calls. But she did even more than that, spying and even working as a cook for the army. She was also a very effective nurse, since she knew a lot of folk remedies from her childhood. She searched the woods for the roots and herbs, and once she found them, she boiled up a bitter drink that saved the lives of many soldiers with dysentery. Apparently, saving people in only one way wasn't enough. Women did plenty of spying during the Civil War. Harriet Tubman was accomplished at espionage. She recruited black men to return to the South by posing as slaves to gather information. She also organized missions for Union troops to free slaves and even led an armed expedition herself, which disrupted enemy supply lines and liberated 700 slaves. But there were other lesser-known spies as well. Rose Greenhow lived in Washington, D.C., but she secretly supported the South. I am a Southern woman, born with revolutionary blood in my veins. She was a famous society hostess, and when important people came to her parties, she'd get them chatty, then send any relevant information to General PGT Beauregard. Confederate President Jefferson Davis said her information was the reason the South won the first Battle of Bull Run. Greenhow drowned in 1864, weighed down by the gold in her pockets meant to fund the Confederates. Elizabeth Van Loo's family owned slaves, but even as a kid, she wasn't down with that. During the war, she helped Union soldiers escape prison. Once recruited as a spy, she ran a whole network with the help of her servant, Mary Bowser. She gathered information and sent coded messages to Union officers in Invisible Ink. She spent her family fortune on her espionage activities and died impoverished. And then there was Belle Boyd. She was only a teenager, but she managed to get important information to General Stonewall Jackson and was arrested numerous times by Union troops. Though yeah, even though she was on the wrong side, you've got to admire her moxie. The world doesn't stop just because of war. People still fell in love and got married, some of them remarkably quickly because war tends to have that effect. Of course, if lots of soldiers were married and lots of soldiers died, that meant lots of women found themselves suddenly widowed. According to an article in Essential Civil War Curriculum, the American Civil War created an unprecedented number of young white widows. There were black widows too, but no one thought to count them. To be fair, no one really knows how many white war widows there were, but based on how many soldiers died and how many were married, the estimate is about 200,000 in four years. This influx changed society. In any town, especially any southern town, there would be at least a handful of women wandering around in black. They were supposed to mourn for two and a half years, which meant staying single for at least that long. But the flirty widow, exemplified by Scarlett O'Hara after she loses her first husband and gone with the wind, emerged and scandalized society. Miss Scarlett, I don't care. I'm too young to be a widow. A lot of these young widows were also pregnant, or they had young children. And now they had no way to support themselves. They also had to get their husband's body home, which was a complicated process. And everyone expected them to treat their husband's memory as sacrosanct. Losing your husband was just the first of a million problems. Being married to a politician during the Civil War meant having a great deal of indirect power. 
Political wives had access to their powerful husbands, but they could also call on other important men and casually give them their opinion about things, which could seriously affect policy and decisions. For example, Verena Davis, First Lady of the Confederacy, was only 35 when her husband took office, but she was an invaluable political ally. During the war, she was never far from her husband's side in case he wanted to discuss how it was going, which he often did. Verena was consulted on military matters, and when her husband became very ill, she controlled access to him, acting almost as chief of staff. In fact, Jefferson Davis took heavy criticism for involving his wife in political decisions. However, just because a woman was in a position of influence, that doesn't mean everything was sunshine and roses. Mary Todd Lincoln didn't have it easy during the war. While her husband was commander-in-chief of the Union, Washington society thought she secretly supported the Confederates. It didn't help that half her family was fighting and dying for the Southern cause, and she lost her 11-year-old son Willie to typhoid fever in 1862, which sent her into a deep depression. 